The Poisoner's Handbook, Murder and the Birth of Forensic Medicine in Jazz Age New York By Deborah Blum Narrated by Colleen Marlowe Copyright 2010 by Deborah Blum This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Deborah Blum, care of William Morris Endeavor Entertainment, LLC, and was produced in the year 2010 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Prologue The Poison Game Until the early 19th century, few tools existed to detect a toxic substance in a corpse. Sometimes investigators deduced poison from the violent sickness that preceded death or built a case by feeding animals a victim's last meal. But more often than not, poisoners walked free. As a result, murder by poison flourished. It became so common in eliminating perceived difficulties such as a wealthy parent who stayed alive too long, that the French nicknamed the metallic element arsenic poudre du succession, the inheritance powder. The chemical revolution of the 1800s changed the relative ease of such killings. Scientists learned to isolate and identify the basic elements in the chemical compounds that define life on Earth, gradually building a catalog, the periodic table of the elements. In 1804, the elements palladium, cerium, iridium, osmium, and rhodium were discovered. Potassium and sodium were isolated in 1807, barium, calcium, magnesium, and strontium in 1808, chlorine in 1810. Once researchers understood individual elements, they went on to study them in combination, examining how elements bonded to create exotic compounds and familiar substances such as the sodium-chlorine combination that creates basic table salt, NaCl. The pioneering scientists who worked in elemental chemistry weren't thinking about poisons in particular, but others were. In 1814, in the midst of this blaze of discovery, the Spanish chemist, Mateo Orfila, published a treatise on poisons and their detection, the first book of its kind. Orfila suspected that metallic poisons like arsenic might be the easiest to detect in the body's tissues and pushed his research in that direction. By the late 1830s, the first test for isolating arsenic had been developed. Within a decade, more reliable tests had been devised and used successfully in criminal prosecutions. But the very science that made it possible to identify the old poisons, like arsenic, also made available a lethal array of new ones— Morphine was isolated in 1804, the same year the palladium was discovered. In 1819, strychnine was extracted from the seeds of the Asian vomit button tree, Strychnos nux vomica. The lethal compound coneine was isolated from hemlock the same year. Chemists neatly extracted nicotine from tobacco leaves in 1828. Aconitine, described by one toxicologist as, in its pure state, perhaps the most potent poison known, was found in the beautifully flowering monkshood plant in 1832. And although researchers had learned to isolate these alkaloids, organic, carbon-based compounds with some nitrogen mixed in, they had no idea how to find such poisons in human tissue. Orfila himself, conducting one failed attempt after another, worried that it was an impossible task. One exasperated French prosecutor, during a mid-nineteenth century trial involving a morphine murder, exclaimed, Henceforth, let us tell would-be poisoners, Do not use metallic poisons, for they leave traces. Use plant poisons. Fear nothing. Your crime will go unpunished. There is no corpus delicti physical evidence, for it cannot be found. So began a deadly cat-and-mouse game, scientists and poisoners as intellectual adversaries, a gun may be fired in a flash of anger, a rock carelessly hurled, a shovel swung in sudden fury, but a homicidal poisoning requires a calculating intelligence. Unsurprisingly, then, when metallic poisons, such as arsenic, became detectable in bodies, informed killers turned away from them. A survey of poison prosecutions in Britain found that, by the mid-nineteenth century, arsenic killings were decreasing. The trickier plant alkaloids were by then more popular among murderers. In response, scientists increased their efforts to capture alkaloids in human tissue. Finally, in 1860, a reclusive and single-minded French chemist, 
Jean Sylvestas, figured out how to isolate nicotine, an alkaloid of the tobacco plant, from a corpse. Other plant poisons soon became more accessible, and chemists were able to offer new assistance to criminal investigations. The field of toxicology was becoming something to be reckoned with, especially in Europe. The knowledge and the scientific determination spread across the Atlantic to the United States. The 1896 book Medical Jurisprudence, Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, co-written by a New York research chemist and a law professor, documented the still fierce competition between scientists and killers. In one remarkable case in New York, a physician had killed his wife with morphine and then put belladonna drops into her eyes to counter the telltale contraction of her pupils. He was convicted only after Columbia University chemist Rudolf Withouse, one of the authors of the 1896 text, demonstrated the process to the jury by killing a cat in the courtroom using the same gruesome technique. There was as much showmanship as science, Whithouse admitted. Toxicology remained a primitive field of research filled with questions still unanswerable. In the early 20th century, industrial innovation flooded the U.S. with a wealth of modern poisons, creating new opportunities for the clever poisoner and new challenges for the country's early forensic detectives. Morphine went into teething medicines for infants, opium into routinely prescribed sedatives. Arsenic was an ingredient in everything from pesticides to cosmetics. Mercury, cyanide, strychnine, chloral hydrate, chloroform, sulfates of iron, sugar of lead, carbolic acid, and more. The products of the new chemistry stocked the shelves of doctors' offices, businesses, homes, pharmacies, and grocery stores. During the Great War, Poison was established as a weapon of warfare, earning World War I the name The Chemist's War, and with the onset of Prohibition, a new chemist's war raged between bootleggers and government chemists working to make moonshine a lethal concoction. In New York's smoky jazz clubs, each round of cocktails became a game of Russian roulette. There was no way for the barely invented science of toxicology to keep up with the deluge, Though a few dogged researchers were putting out manuals and compiling textbooks on the subject, too many novel compounds had yet to be analyzed, and most doctors had little or no training in the subject. In 1918, however, New York City made a radical reform that would revolutionize the poison game and launch toxicology into front-page status. Propelled by a series of scandals involving corrupt coroners and unsolved murders, the city hired its first trained medical examiner, a charismatic pathologist by the name of Charles Norris. Once in office, Norris swiftly hired an exceptionally driven and talented chemist named Alexander Gettler and persuaded him to found and direct the city's first toxicology laboratory. Together, Norris and Gettler elevated forensic chemistry in this country into a formidable science. Trailblazing scientific detectives, they earned a respected place in the courtroom, crusaded against compounds dangerous to public health, and stopped a great many Jazz Age poisoners in their tracks. As they determinedly countered the obstacles faced in each new case, they developed innovative new laboratory methods for teasing toxins from human tissue. Their scientific contribution became a legacy for future generations. But this story begins before Charles Norris or Alexander Gettler took office before forensic toxicology was considered a fully legitimate science. It begins in the gray of a frozen January in the city, when an unlikely serial killer decided to make his move in the poison game. <laughs>